Well, hi, friends. Look at all of you. You guys are beautiful women. I am Shannon Vandewerker. If I have not met you, hi. Um, please come and introduce yourself to me. Would love to meet you if we have not met. If we have met, I'm so glad that you came and that we are here among friends tonight. Um, Carrie and Erica just welcomed you, but I want to say welcome. We have been praying for you, specifically for you, um, for months now. And um, there have been a team of women who have been praying for you. And can I just tell you, there's people in Texas praying for you. I got a text message from a friend today saying, I'm praying for the women's conference. Um, God is up to something, and we get to be a part of it. Are you guys ready? Yes. Um, so we named this conference Encountering Jesus because we hope that you do just that. We hope that you have an encounter with the living God who is active in your life and who is longing for you to know him in a deeper way. Throughout the course of the conference, we're going to be um, studying four different encounters that women had in the Gospels with Jesus. And as we examine these stories, I want to challenge you to find yourself in each one of them. Use this time these next few days to really listen to what God is saying to you. You'll see some distinctives between the four stories, but you'll also hear some overlap between them. And if you hear things more than once, that's often something to pay attention to. In my own life, if I hear something more than once, that's often the Holy Spirit speaking to me to say, listen up, Shannon, I'm trying to teach you something here. Tonight, we have the opportunity to hear the Samaritan woman's story, and it's in John chapter 4. So if you have a Bible or if you have a, a Bible app on your phone, I want you to open it up. We're going to read along. It will also be up on the screen, but it, sometimes it's helpful to also be able to read it from your own Bible. Um, there is a lot to unpack in this story, and so I want to just jump right in and get started. It says this in chapter 4, uh, the book of John, chapter 4, verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. When we find Jesus in John chapter 4, it's clear that he's getting out of Dodge. The Pharisees, who are the religious leaders of the day, they didn't like the message that Jesus had, and they feared his growing popularity. And so Jesus, knowing that he had much more to do in his ministry before he would die, he was wise, and he said, I got to get out of town. And so he goes from Judea and travels to Galilee. Now, to us, the two names of these towns hold no significance. Um, we don't know where they are. We don't know why they're significant. But y'all are smart. I believe it. And so we're going to go back to geography class tonight. Are you guys ready? Yes. Okay. So take a look at this map, and you'll see these two locations, um, Judea in the south, Galilee in the north. And do you see the gray dashed line? So the gray dashed line is the route that Jews would typically take to travel from Judea into Galilee. They took a longer route to go from Judea into Galilee because they didn't want to go through Samaria. They went around it. And they did this because Samaritans and Jews didn't associate with each other. Now, we don't have time tonight to get into all of the why, into why they didn't associate with each other, but I will say this. 
that Samaria was originally was given to two of Joseph's sons. If you are part of Chapel Point, we've been going through Joseph's story for a long time. Um, This land was given to two of Joseph's sons. And then after the division of Israel, people who had intermarried with other races lived there. And the Jews resented them for what they thought was defiling their land. And so for um, generations and generations, hundreds of years, there was enmity between these two groups, between Jews and Samaritans. Okay, so let's go back to what it said in verse 3 and 4. It says, Jesus left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to go through Samaria. Now, this is John, the author of this gospel's way of calling this out. By looking at the map, we know that Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria. There was another route. There was a traditional route that Jews would take, but Jesus chose to go through Samaria on purpose because there was a divine encounter that he knew he needed to have with a woman there. And so that's the route that he took. My friends, there are divine encounters all over your life that God is orchestrating. Are you paying attention to them? So verse 5, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sakar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. This woman comes at the sixth hour. This means that she comes at noon in the heat of the day. Women in this culture would typically come early in the morning and they would walk from the town out to the well to draw the water that they needed for their cooking, for their cleaning for the day. They also um, lived in a communal culture, culture where they would do this together. Now, this woman is not coming in the morning, and she's not coming with any other women. She's coming by herself. And in a few verses, you'll find out why. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman from Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, And who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, maybe you've heard this story before, and it's kind of too familiar to get the significance of it. Or maybe you're hearing this story for the first time, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you. Um, tonight, we're invited to pay attention to the details of this story. See, Jesus approaches her, a woman, in the middle of the day as an invitation to conversation and to relationship. She knows who she is. She knows that she's a woman and she's a Samaritan, and she also knows who he is, a man and a Jew. She would have been the very last person that a Jew would have asked for help from. And yet, Jesus is very intentional about initiating conversation with her. He would have known this, being a very good Jew himself. And yet, 
he still encounters her. He still enters into conversation with her because he knows this is a divine encounter. Something's going to change because I am blowing the doors off of these cultural barriers that have been set up between Jews and Samaritans. This interaction, it's a little bit comical. He's trying to talk to her about eternal things, and she responds with an intellectual statement. It's like he's saying, your life, your entire life is dehydrated, and I have water that will satisfy your life through eternity. And she's worried about the brand of water that he's offering. She wants to know if he's going to use the water from Jacob's well. It's like she's asking him, well, are you going to use Kirkland brand or are you going to use the electrolyte infused smart water? (laughs) Right? And he says to her, I have water that you know nothing about. I have living water. Have you ever been dehydrated? Anybody? It's awful. It starts with feeling really parched, really thirsty. Your mouth gets dry, then you get a headache. Your energy is depleted. You don't want to do anything because your body is starting to go into its reserves in order to keep functioning. Your body needs water to keep going. Did you know that 78% of your body is made up of water? I didn't know that. If you don't replenish your body with the water that it needs, it will shut down. Here's the thing. Some of your lives are dehydrated. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually. A dehydrated spiritual life keeps God at arm's length, not allowing him to enter into the messy, the shameful, and the hard. Is your life dehydrated? Each of us is like the Samaritan woman. God is initiating conversation with us. Maybe you know that God wants relationship with you, and yet you're responding like the Samaritan woman with intellectual statements. Keeping God kind of away, rather than offering your heart and allowing yourself to be known. If you're identifying with what I'm talking about, I want you to listen to what Jesus says next to the Samaritan woman. In verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus says to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you will worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he he will tell us all these things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. See, she continues to have this intellectual conversation with Jesus. She wants the water that he's going to give her because she doesn't want to come to the well. And then we find out why. Jesus speaks right 
into her life. He says, call your husband. And she replies, I don't have a husband. In fact, I've had five. And the one that I'm living with isn't my husband. This is why she comes to the well alone. This is why she doesn't come with the other women from the town. This is why she's isolated from the community. See, she was an outcast. She was stuck in the shame of the way that she was living. And so she wanted to hide. She wanted to isolate. She went to get water when the other women weren't there. She waited until the heat of the day to get what she needed because she was living in the shame of her life. And yet it's to this woman that Jesus goes out of his way to have this divine encounter and initiate relationship with her. This is not by chance. My friends, shame will tell you, you are unworthy of Jesus. Shame will tell you that you are unworthy of love that you are unworthy of God's initiation of relationship with you. Shame will tell you to hide and to isolate. But the message that we're hearing tonight is that we, you and I, are invited out of shame and into relationship with the living water himself. How are you responding to that invitation? Are you caught in shame tonight? Maybe some of you heard shame speaking to you before you got here. Don't go to that women's conference. You're not worthy of God's love. He doesn't want your worship. Why would you go to church? You've really messed things up. See, shame will paralyze you from stepping into the life that God has for you. But tonight, I want you to hear me say, do not let it, ladies. Don't let shame isolate you from God and from biblical community. If this is you tonight, I want to invite you to allow shame to propel you into freedom, to propel you into relationship with God, rather than let it prevent you from relationship. See, this woman was living in shame and yet she had this glimmer of hope. She says, we're waiting for the Messiah. We're waiting for the one who's going to save us. And Jesus tells her, you're looking at him. I'm, I am the person that you have been waiting for. My sisters, if you don't hear anything else tonight, I want you to hear this. There is freedom, and his name is Jesus Christ. There is hope because there's a Savior. There is peace, and it is available to you tonight. You don't have to live in shame. You can step into freedom. Listen to how Jesus' conversation with this woman does just that. Verse 27, just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and we're coming to him. See, she immediately goes and tells everyone in the town, the very people that she was isolating from, the truth about her shame. 
and the truth about who Jesus is. Here's the thing. You can know intellectually like the woman did about God. You can know intellectually about Jesus. You can come to church. You can go to Bible study. You can be serving and you can still keep God at arm's length. We do this because we don't want to be known. Because whatever you're struggling with might feel like too much. Too much for the church. Too much for the women in your Bible study. Let me tell you, it is not too much for God. Jesus went out of his way. He left heaven and came to earth for you. He was intentional with his divine encounter with you, my sisters. He bore all of your sin, all of your shame on the cross. Your sin has been crucified with him so that you can drink deeply from Jesus Christ himself all of your days. Romans says, Christ demonstrated his love for you, that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. So walk into being known by God. Not just intellectually knowing him. Jesus speaks right into the Samaritan woman's shame. And that transformed her. This experience with Jesus empowered her to go and to tell everyone in the town about how she had encountered the living God, the living water. Verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to him, said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Now let's pause our story here and do a little flashback to verse eight. In verse eight, it says this in parentheses. It's like an aside. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now, the disciples leave Jesus at the well, and they go into town to buy food. The disciples know Jesus. They're not new to who he is. They have had their own encounters with him. And yet they go to the same place that the Samaritan woman goes, and they don't tell anyone that Jesus is there. They're concerned about buying food, making sure they have something to eat, making sure that he has something to eat. They completely miss it. And Jesus calls them out. In verse 35, do not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. He says the fields are ripe for eternal life. He's saying people are ready to hear the good news of freedom in Jesus Christ. He says, I'm inviting people to be known, and then I'm empowering them to go and to tell others. See, they had every opportunity to go and to tell people in the town that Jesus was at their well, that Jesus was in their midst. And all they were worried about was getting food. Let that sink in a little bit. 
See, who Jesus was was not lost on the Samaritan woman. It says immediately she leaves her bucket. She left the reason why she went to the well in the first place. And she gets up and runs into town and she tells everybody that Jesus is here. It says in 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Remember, she was an outcast. She was isolated from the community. And yet many people came to believe in him because of her testimony. So when the Samaritans came, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two more days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is is indeed the Savior of the world. It wasn't a complicated message that she had. She didn't need all of the right words. She just told them the experience that she had with Jesus and then invited them to come and to see for themselves. See, we complicate it, don't we? We think we need the right words and the right order and the right theological concepts, the right timing. She didn't wait to go and tell when she encountered Jesus. She immediately got up and she went to tell others about him. It doesn't have to be complicated. Talk about how God has changed you. Talk about the movement of God that you're experiencing in this place. Talk about how you are encountering the love of God and the peace of Christ. See, tonight, I think there's three types of women sitting here. And as as you listen to me describe these three types of women, I want you to think about which one you are. And then I want to invite you to take a next step. First, I think there are women here who have never taken the step to trust Jesus, to accept his forgiveness for your sins, and who have never surrendered their whole life to Jesus. You are the Samaritan woman living in the shame of the choices that you've made, and you're desperate for freedom. If that is you, I pray that tonight, tonight, you have an encounter with Jesus that changes you for eternity. He is calling you out of your shame to lay down your sin, to surrender your life to him. There is freedom, my friends, available for you. And it's found at the feet of Jesus. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's right. Second, I I think there's women here who have lived in an intellectual knowledge of Jesus and you've also kept God at arm's length. You don't want him getting so close to you. You don't want him messing things up in your life. Maybe because you're scared to allow yourself to be known. To allow yourself to to be in relationship with somebody who wants to walk with you in the hard and the messy and the painful. But here's the thing, and we see it in the Samaritan woman's life. God already knows all of the crevices of your heart. He already knows all the sin that you're tangled in. We saw it in her story. He said, call your husband. She said, I don't have one. He said, you're right. He knew. God knows. He already knows. So invite him into closer relationship. Stop keeping him at arm's length. 
Step into the embrace that he wants to have with you. If this describes you, then the invitation is first to allow yourself to be known by God. And then secondly, to step into biblical community. We experience God's knowing of us when we allow ourselves to be known by one another. If you have never experienced the power of having a biblical friendship, can I tell you, can I implore you to allow yourself to do that? Allow yourself to be known. Allow yourself to be loved by the church. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to be messy. But it will also be the sweetest relationships that you have this side of heaven. Third, I think there's women here who have walked following Christ. You have been faithful to him. You have allowed yourself to be known. And yet, you have a hard time going and telling other people about how you have encountered Jesus. There are people in this community, there are people in your life who are walking around thinking they don't need God, they don't need his love, and they need you to tell them you're wrong. There's people in your life, there's people in this community who desperately want to be told that God has not forgotten them. There's people in your life wondering that tonight. Has God forgotten me? And guess what? You're the answer to that question. You get to tell them, no, God has not forgotten you, and I'm here to walk with you. You are to go and tell. Not your co-worker, not your neighbor, not your friend, not your sister. You are to go and to tell. Do you hear, did you hear what Jesus told his disciples? I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have gone before us. Others have labored. Now it's time for us to stand up and to reap what God is ready to do for people's eternity. Others have gone before you. They've tilled the hard ground and it's ripe for harvest. Will you go? Will you reap that harvest of eternal life? This is real, my friends. Heaven is real. Eternity is real. We are not just playing church here. There are people in your life who desperately need to know that God cares about them that God loves them, that God is inviting them out of shame and into relationship. Maybe there's somebody specific that right now God is bringing to your mind. Will you be obedient to that nudge? To step into that relationship, to walk in the mess for the glory of God. Three types of women. The woman who's never surrendered her whole life to Christ. The woman who's keeping God at arm's length. And the woman who is afraid to go and tell. Which one are you? Tonight, we're going to give you the opportunity to pray the opportunity to respond, 
the opportunity to worship our great God and to take a next step. I want to challenge you to stay in this space, to stay in this time, to do just that. I know it's bedtime. If you have kids, you might be getting text messages. Allow this space to be sacred. Allow this time to listen to what God's saying to you. And then I want to challenge you to respond. No matter where you've identified yourself tonight in these kind of three categories, if you have heard the voice of God tonight calling you, I want you to respond. If you've heard the voice of God saying, come, surrender it all to me. I want you to respond. If you've heard the voice of God tonight saying, step out of your shame and into being known, I want you to respond tonight. If you've heard the voice of God telling you, you need to go and tell her, you need to go and tell him, I want you to respond. We're going to have some women up here in the front who are um, here to pray with you. I'll, I'll come down as well. Don't leave this place the same. Take the step to come and be prayed for. Take the step to write something down. Take the step to tell your friend who you came with, this is what God's doing. This is what I heard. We are not guaranteed tomorrow, ladies. I sure hope that we all get together tomorrow and worship our great God again. But we are not guaranteed it. Don't wait. Respond tonight. Do something with what you've heard and allow God to transform you. Let me pray. Jesus, for this amazing group of women, I am grateful. I'm grateful for these sisters in Christ. I'm grateful for this divine encounter that we have had with you tonight. And for the bravery of the Samaritan woman who said, yes, I will go and I will tell. And now thousands of years later, we're still telling her story. Jesus, we need you. We need you to transform our hearts, to transform our lives. And so, God, I want to humbly just say and ask, would you do something in our hearts tonight in a way that we don't understand, but that we only can say, but it was God. Show up, God. Continue to show up. Thank you for showing up, Jesus. Give these women courage to take a step of faith into relationship with you, into relationship with others, in the biblical community, into being known. God, may your spirit speak truth and love and goodness over these women tonight. That they would leave changed because they have encountered you. I pray this in your powerful name.